Before we jump into today's show, I just have a quick message for you all. I just have received so many emails from you about the Smithsonian Associates content and how much you enjoy it. Smithsonian is thrilled too and is giving you an exclusive offer. Please know, though, I'm not doing this for payment. The entire discount is passed along to you by generosity of Smithsonian Associates. I think that's really important. Smithsonian Associates is offering a special discount to not old better listeners to save 20 bucks. I mean, to save $20, that's a lot. To save $20 on a ticket, call the number 202-633-3030, 202-633-3030. That'll be posted on the website, of course, and use the promo code 232-100. The offer is valid on ticket orders, including Smithsonian sleepovers, everybody, including Smithsonian sleepovers. So if you're a grandparent out there and you've got your grandchild over the summer and you're looking for something cool to do, check out the smithsoniansleepovers.org page for some really wonderful night at the museum kinds of activities to do. This is just fantastic for our audience, but the offer's valid on ticket orders, again, including Smithsonian sleepovers through August 31st. So everybody, again, promo code <laughs> 232-100-232-100 and call Smithsonian at 202-633-3030. I think you guys are just going to love this. I think this is really a neat thing that Smithsonian's doing. So please enjoy. And now welcome to the Not Old Better Show. <laughs> and as part of our Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series, my guest today is Dr. Mario Livio. Dr. Mario Livio is an internationally known astrophysicist, a best-selling author, and a popular speaker. Dr. Livio will be presenting at the Smithsonian Associates Program Wednesday, July 12, 2017 at the Ripley Center in Washington, D.C. I will be talking about human curiosity, uh, basically a number of aspects of human curiosity. Uh, you know, what are the mechanisms in our brain? What is the psychological state that we have when we are curious? And also about a few very curious people, uh, a few that no longer live, like Leonardo da Vinci, but a few also that live that, and whom I interviewed. Uh, all of this uh, is in the context of uh, my new book, uh, which is called Why? What Makes Us Curious? That, of course, was our guest today, Dr. Mario Livio. Dr. Livio is also author of six popular science books, including international bestsellers, The Golden Ratio, and Is God a Mathematician?, which many in our Smithsonian audience will recognize as the basis for the 2016 Emmy-nominated NOVA program, The Great Math Mystery. Dr. Livio's book, Brilliant Blunders, was a national bestseller in the United States and was selected by the Washington Post as one of the best books of the year. His most recent book, Why? What Makes Us Curious, is being released on July 11th, 2017, and will be available for signing after Dr. Livio's presentation the night of July 12th. So come to the presentation, grab one of the books, and you can get it signed by Dr. Mario Livio. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mario Livio via Skype to the Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series on the Not Old Better Show. Well, first of all, Dr. Mario Livio, welcome to the show. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, Wednesday, July 12th, 2017, you'll be appearing at the Smithsonian Associates speaking on the subject of what makes us curious. Give us a sense as to what we might expect in your answer to that question, what makes us curious. So uh, this, this is the subtitle of my book, and it was uh, especially chosen so as to be a little bit ambiguous, because what I mean by that is not only you know, what things are we curious about, but also uh, what are the mechanisms in our brains when we are curious. So uh, basically, I'll be talking about human curiosity and uh, both in terms of psychological studies of it, uh, neuroscientific studies of it, 
and some interviews I made with extraordinarily curious people. And I had a chance, of course, Dr. Livio, to do a fair bit of research on you. There are some distinct types of curiosity. I wonder if you could touch a little bit on those and give us a little sense as to what those distinct types are and what those really mean. The types are, uh, you know, this is not a unique classification of curiosity. It's one that I found quite useful, which was suggested by psychologist Daniel Berlin. Um, And the types are, for example, there is something that he termed a perceptual curiosity. Uh, this is the curiosity when that we feel when something surprises us or, or when we see something that's ambiguous, that we cannot quite tell what it means, uh, things of that nature. Then there is a curiosity that we feel uh, when, you know, we want to conduct basic scientific research or want to do some uh, incredible work of art. Uh, and that he termed epistemic curiosity. That's the love of knowledge, if you like. Uh, that uh, most of us have. Um, Then there are two other types uh, which are a little bit more marginal but important in everyday life. One is specific curiosity. Uh, Specific curiosity is when we we miss a particular piece of information, like, you know, uh, who was it that wrote that book, you know, and so on. And finally, diversive curiosity uh, is the type of curiosity you may have uh, toward of boredom. Uh, this is, you know, when you see uh, young people, for example, continuously searching for text messages uh, or, uh, you know, waiting impatiently for the appearance of a new smartphone and things like that. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the book, Why? What Makes Us Curious? In your research, two distinct names appear, and the names are two distinctly different people, both for obvious reasons, and and I'm sure they're very curious people. I'm referring to your research interviews with Noam Chomsky, uh, the noted linguist and scientist and philosopher, and then fellow astrophysicist, uh, Dr. Brian May, and my audience is probably going to know Brian May less for his PhD in astrophysics and more for his stunning virtuoso guitar work as lead guitarist of the rock band Queen uh, of Bohemian Rhapsody fame. But those are distinctly different people. Those must have been fascinating conversations that you had in the book. So tell us a little bit about the conclusions that you drew in talking to people like Noam Chomsky and Brian May. Yes, I I, I will uh, add, though, that my interview with Chomsky was on the short side. I mean, my interview with Brian May was much longer. Um, So Noam Chomsky, you know, of course, he's known as a linguist, but also, you know, he writes about politics, he writes Mm -hmm. about music, he writes about the brain. Um, And and I was very interested, you know, uh, what is it that, you know, drives somebody like him uh, into so many fields and so many interests. And the one thing that, of course, is pretty amazing is uh, his work as as a linguist. Um, And he gave a very, very good answer to why he is so interested about that uh, by saying that that is really a very unique human ability, you know, language. Mm. Um, And and, and so that's partly why, uh, you know, he got so much into that. And I could really very much connect to that because during my research I discovered that the ability to ask why is also uniquely human. So, you know, in that sense, uh, I could definitely feel, you know, why he wants to to look into such things. In the case of Brian May, it's a very different type, of course, of person and personality. Uh, He is, of course, best known as, as a guitarist and a musician. He also wrote many of the songs of Queen. Um, But what some people don't know is that, you know, he first did a degree in astrophysics uh, as an undergrad and then, you know, became this famous musician. And then 33 years later, he went back and finished his PhD in astrophysics. And I thought that this was, you know, very, very unusual and wanted to understand what drove him to this. And, uh, you know, the story that he gave was a very interesting one in which 
he was interested always in astronomy and astrophysics, but uh, he felt that music was kind of a call that he couldn't resist, uh, and he had to go to the music. And then, you know, only many years later, when it turned out that he actually could go back to do astrophysics, he decided to actually do that. Curiosity has a marked uh, set of uh, really telltale signs that are visible uh, on our face. It also has a very marked impact on the brain. I've seen you talk about uh, a very well-known Rembrandt painting uh, known as the anatomy lesson of Dr. Uh, Nicholas uh, Tulp. And, and in that painting, Rembrandt really captures the expressions on the faces of those people standing around the corpse. We'll put this, an image of this painting up on the website so people can see this if they're not familiar. But you can really see what happens to the face when people are curious, but what happens to the brain when we satisfy curiosity? So, well, you know, there are two things that happen to the brain. One is when we're actually curious and then when we satisfy curiosity. And these are two somewhat different things. And this is where actually the difference between um, perceptual curiosity, that curiosity that we feel when we are surprised or, or see something ambiguous, and the curiosity that is associated with the love of knowledge, you know, the one that drives research and so on, this is where they become s somewhat distinct. Um, the one we feel when it's a surprise or, or ambiguous uh, stimuli um, uh, activates in our brains the, those regions that are associated with conflict or with an unpleasant condition, namely the fact that we're curious puts us in a state that is unpleasant to us and we become curious in order to actually get out of that state. Uh, that's that situation. On the other hand, epistemic curiosity, the one we feel as, as a love of knowledge and, you know, in order to explore and so on, um, that actually puts, uh, activates in our brains those regions that are in anticipation uh, responsible for an word. So we see the satisfaction of curiosity in that case, I mean, even before it actually happens, we have an anticipation of reward. In both cases, the reward system is activated once we satisfy the curiosity. So when looking at that painting, we see everyone standing around kind of this, what looks like this autopsy. We can see on the faces almost this anticipation of a reward because we've felt it before. and. It might not necessarily be that something new is going to be discovered. It's just something that we don't know, and we're wondering about what might be discovered. That's right, and and I I always liked that, that uh, Rembrandt painting. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, it is uh, well, not only it is a fantastic painting, but it is also. The focus of the of the painting is on this curiosity of the people. It's not on, you know, the explanation or the body that's there or and nothing like that. It's really the expressions on on the faces of all those people around uh, Dr. Tope. Yeah, because I agree with you. I, I love that painting too, and we will put a picture up on the site of that painting. But when you look at the corpse, the corpse is almost. An afterthought, really, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, it's those faces that just pull you in. Let's jump to maybe a little bit more complex material about curiosity, uh, uh, Dr. Livio. I, I want to ask you about why why we should even be curious, and maybe another example that I've found in your work is this uh, this reference to. Um, average deviations of temperature over the last century. While that may look like something very boring, it's, it's actually something very crucial for us. And so you don't have to be a meteorologist to understand some of that stuff, but being curious is an important thing, especially right now. Right. So uh, indeed, you know, presentation of data uh, does not sound like particularly exciting to, to most people, but when you present that type of data and something immediately jumps at you, namely 
that you know all the last few years or the last decade uh, the earth reached temperatures that are higher than any temperatures seen before then you know you cannot ignore that mm-hmm. and you have to become curious as to why that is and that of course is you know what we call climate change that the earth on the average is becoming warmer and warmer and and you as you pointed out you don't have to be a meteorologist to, to see that simply you know because just the points for the last two years are at the very top of those temperatures so once you see that uh, then of course you say okay so why is that and that's when you become curious and that's when you are driven to start to study this phenomenon because you realize that this phenomenon can have devastating consequences. We are with Dr. Mario Livio. Dr. Livio will be speaking July 12, 2017 at the Smithsonian Associates. He's going to be speaking on the subject of what makes us curious. Dr. Livio has written an excellent new book. That book is going to be part of a book signing on the day of the presentation at the Smithsonian. The title of the book is Why? What makes us curious? Dr. Levy, I know you're really busy. I've just got one final question for you. With all of this information that's available on hand via the web and many, many other sources, do we have anything still to be curious about? Uh, Yes, absolutely so. Um, Let me make two points. One is, I remind you that when we do scientific research, for example, uh, we are trying to answer questions to which we don't know the answers yet. And that means that you actually cannot find the answer on the internet because <laughs> it doesn't exist. Uh, so, so it, you know, so it shouldn't stop us from doing all the research that we're doing. That's one thing. The second thing is, while certainly the availability of lots of information on the web, um, you know, you can get answers quicker to many questions. By, by, you know, by Googling them. Also, it doesn't necessarily make you less curious. I mean, on, on the contrary, at some level, you know, you can find out more things that maybe before you wouldn't bother to be curious about because there was very little chance for you to be able to actually reach that information and satisfy your curiosity. So unlike some people who think that the internet is killing curiosity, Uh, I I think that it can actually aid curiosity. Well, Dr. Mario Olivio, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, uh, Dr. Olivio will be with us at the Smithsonian Associates on Wednesday, July 12th. Dr. Olivio's new book, Why? What Makes Us Curious from Simon & Schuster will be discussed there, will be available for book signing. Dr. Olivio joins us today via Skype. Thanks so much for your time today, Dr. Olivio. We're looking forward. These are, these are such great questions for, for our audience, and so we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you today. Thrilled to be seeing you on July 12th. My pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Olivio. My thanks, of course, go to Dr. Mario Olivio and the Smithsonian Associates for help in putting together this great show, as well as this wonderful offer available to Not Old Better listeners. Again, that's the offer that comes as a result of you using as program code 232100. You can call 202-633-3030. We'll put all of that into our notes today. But thanks again to Smithsonian Associates and Dr. Mario Olivio. Enjoy this program. Remember, Dr. Livio will be at Smithsonian Associates Ripley Center July 12th. Thanks, everybody.